Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third multiscale talk given by Dr. Veronica McDance. Veronica is a postdoctoral researcher at Smart Nano Bio Devices at the Institute for Bioengineering of Catalonia, acronymed as IBEC. Prior to joining IBEC, she has conducted postdoctoral research at Applied Zoology at TU Dresden in Germany. She obtained her PhD degree in biology from TU Dresden and conducted the research at the Leibniz Institute for Solid State and Materials Research, abbreviated in, in German as IFW Dresden. Today, Veronica is going to talk about biohybrid microrobots. What sperm can teach us about microrobotics? So, Veronica, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. I'm happy to give you this talk today. And just going to share my screen. And there we go. Can you see it okay? Yep. I okay. can see it. Great. All right. As Zoran already mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about biohybrid microbots and specifically uh, some that have sperm cells integrated. And by doing that, I want to show you how. Uh, sperm cells can teach us things about microrobotics and how to develop better microrobots. And first, a little bit of a, a deeper introduction about myself. I'm actually a biotechnologist. Uh, I studied at TU Braunschweig. And during that time, I also went uh, on exchange to the University of Waterloo in Canada and studied chemical engineering. And during that time, I was able to um, do a short research stay at the Carl Hansen Lab in Vancouver in high, throu high throughput biology. And that really got me hooked with the micro stuff. And after my degree, I did uh, something else for a few years and then returned to research in 2012 to do my PhD at the Institute for Integrative Nanoscience with Professor Oliver Schmidt and at the IFW Dresden. And that's when I really started working in microrobotics. Um, after my PhD, I was awarded an open topic postdoc uh, and was more working in the biology uh, at the applied zoology group in Dresden, um, digging deeper into sperm biology, which was really fun. And last year I got awarded a Humboldt fellowship, which brought me here to Barcelona to work at the IBEC. So micro nanorobotics is a really fascinating field with a vision of miniaturizing medical tasks. For example, to, to envision to be able to move remotely controlled tiny robots inside the human body. And in order to achieve this vision, um, these micro robots need to be able to move autonomously. So they have to have onboard energy source but also we need to be able to precisely control them um, in a remote fashion. And of course they need to perform certain tasks like um, manipulating cells or delivering cargo. And in general, we, uh, we think that these micro nanorobots have potential in drug and cell delivery, in cell manipulation for minimally invasive surgery in sensing and diagnostics, and also in environmental remediation. And uh, here I, um, I've been working in this field for a few years, and I just want to introduce some approaches to you that I've been working with. For example, you can make catalytic microjets. Um, this is, for example, a microtube that is rolled up and has an inner layer of platinum, which is catalytic and can move very fast in diluted solutions of hydrogen peroxide. And um, it creates very fast bubbles and expels these bubbles from the tube and then uh, shows very fast motion. Um, I've also been working with biomimetic polymeric swimmers that move by shape change. Like you can see here, this jellyfish-like swimmer. Uh, and I mostly spend my time doing my PhD on sperm-driven robots. So in this case, we have motile sperm cells that were captured in microtubes, and then we can use the cells as propulsion source and can use the microtube to control the direction of this swimmer. And lately, in the last few years, we've also investigated sperm templated microrobots where we use the intrinsic flexibility of sperm cells and cover the cells with magnetic particles 
um, to uh, be able to magnetically actuate these cells. So why biohybrid? Why don't we use purely artificial robots? And I want to point out here some, um, some important features of biological cells and of artificial components that if we combine them, bring us really interesting um, properties. So biological cells are known to operate efficiently on a micro scale. When we think about bacteria or sperm cells, they can move quite fast on the, on the micro scale. And they're also very smart cells. So they have many sensing abilities, taxes abilities to follow different external stimuli. They're also able to adapt very well to the environment, for example, to highly viscous fluids, to obstacles, to tight spaces. And some cells even have the ability to repair themselves. Now our artificial components that we add to this um, biohybrid um, device is further functionality, for example, through the choice of material, if we want to bring in some magnetic components or through the geometry or topography, we can add further functionality. So specifically, why did I want to use sperm cells in microrobotics? These sperm cells are a very fast driving source. Um, they carry information, so they actually bring the DNA uh, of the male gamete to the egg cell. They can also act as drug carriers, which we've shown in recent years by loading cancer drugs into the cell. They can also be the cargo when we think about applications towards re reproductive technology. Um, they are very smart sensors, so these cells can respond to a single molecule. Uh, and change their direction in response to that. They also can sense uh, temperature gradients, fluid flow, and many other things. And again, they're very well adapted to physiological environments. And further, they have this intrinsic flexibility, which uh, I will talk about in, in, in a few minutes. So what I did during my PhD was then uh, by the use of rolled up nanotechnology, which was established at the IFW Dresden to tune the size of these microtubes to fit single sperm cells inside. In this case, here we see uh, bull sperm cells and this bull sperm were, were captured in these microtubes and they're strong enough to push these tubes forward. And then we could use weak external magnetic fields to guide the sperm cells to our target location. Now, the next step was to, um, to be able to release the cells again, which is a bit tricky if you're working with rigid materials, but we decided to incorporate a thermal responsive polymer into these microtubes that allowed us by a small change in the temperature to release the cells up on demand. And that's what we see here in the video, the cell is captured. As we increase the temperature a few degrees, uh, this, the microtube opens up and then the sperm cell can be released by a, by a small temperature trigger. And there it swims up, yes. Um, then another approach um, for the sperm-driven micro robots was to use gelatin as the artificial component or actually a biomaterial based uh, component. But why did I choose gelatin? It's not only more biocompatible and biodegradable, which means it can be degraded by um, bodily enzymes. It also has the ability to respond to pH changes. And this allows us an uptake and release of a drug. And more than that, uh, gelatin also uh, has antioxidant um, property, which I will explain in a second. So why did I want to use pH triggered or pH uh, responsive material? Uh, in fact, sperm cells swim through a large range of pH on their way to the fertilization site. So for example, they started a pH four to five, and then in the uterus, we have already more neutral pH of six to seven. And close to the fertilization site, we have a pH eight. So what I did to um, demonstrate in situ um, manipulation of sperm by um, release of a 
activating agent was that I loaded heparin at pH 5 into these gelatin microcartridges. Now heparin is our agent that triggers sperm capacitation and this capacitation is a very important step prior to fertilization to get the sperm cells ready for fertilization. Otherwise they would not be able to fuse with the oocyte. So we load this heparin into the micro cartridge. Then we capture sperm cells at pH five uh, in this drug loaded um, micro cartridge. Then we can change the pH to pH eight, which triggers a release of the heparin from the microstructure and locally activates the sperm cell um, which results in this capacitation. And this is for more biochemically so analyzed and um, I will not go into detail here, but you can find the, the biochemical and molecular analysis in, in, the, in this article. Um, one more thing we demonstrated with these microcartridges from gelatin is that they can scavenge oxygen radicals. And as you might know, Oxidative stress is one of the main reasons for DNA damage. And this is very critical for sperm cells, especially when they're handled in vitro. So we showed that these gelatin cartridges can actually um, protect the sperm cells by catching these radicals, which avoids then the DNA damage of the cells. Now in, uh, in another approach of biohybrid microrobots, but not, not sperm, driven but sperm templated microrobots, we use magnetic particles which are positively charged and incubate them with negatively charged uh, bull sperm. In this case, we don't care about the viability because we only use the cells as a template, as a flexible template. So what happens is we get this electrostatic interaction between the particles and the sperm cells. And this results in our hybrid structure, which we call iron sperm. And it's basically a particle covered sperm cell. And then we can introduce this to a 3D rotating magnetic field, which you see here on the left. This is a setup, which is run by um, Islam Khalil in a surgical robotics lab in Twente and some other collaboration partners. And what we did is then we apply the rotating field and you can really nicely see this flexible motion of the sperm cell. So we can basically reactivate the sperm cells or we can um, actuate them. This is at two Hertz, but you can also apply higher frequency and you see them nicely moving forward. So this is a very simple way of fabricating flexible magnetic swimmers. Now, what we noticed is um, that the particles tend to bind on different parts of the sperm cells. And morphologically, we have four distinct areas, which is the head, the mid piece, the principal piece, and the distal end. And they're also known to have different flexibilities. So what we started doing was we categorized all the sperm template swimmers that we found into these four segments that can either have magnetic particles or not. So we end up with 15 categories and we name them, um, for example, one zero 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 cell is a cell that has magnetic particles only on its head, but not on a mid piece, principal piece or distal end. And then we, we started looking in, at them because we got very, uh, huge variety of the way they moved and how fast they moved. So we started categorizing them. And you can see here, for example, in the group one, which means they have one magnetic segment, they move very differently. So the first example where we have magnetic particles on the head and the tail is, is not magnetic, but is being pulled behind, they move forward quite nicely. But if we have the magnetic segment in the middle part of the cell, it's not uh, propelling them forward very well because in principle you end up with a magnetic element that has two flexible filaments in both directions, which is counterproductive. Then in the second group, we have two magnetic segments and you get many different configurations. 
And uh, what's interesting is here, when you have two magnetic segments that are not connect, uh, that are um, distant from each other, they also work against each other and don't um, result in very good forward motion. In the third group, we have here three magnetic segments. You also see different actuation here. And in the last case, we have the motor cell, which is the live sperm cell. Oh, sorry, that was too fast. The live sperm cell and a cell that has four magnetic uh, segments. So then we did an in detail um, frequency response, which means we applied a magnetic field of rotating frequency from one to 20 and uh, analyze many samples to find which configuration of these magnetic segments is really beneficial. And this was uh, work done by Jacobo uh, during his master thesis on was quite interesting because you get a huge variety of swimmers, but we can crystallize out some configurations that are more beneficial, such as the 1100 cells. So cells that have magnetic particles only on the head, and midpiece, um, or only on uh, their first three segments. So in the next study, we looked more in detail in at the waveform of the cells. So we compare a motile cell and the wave pattern with our magnetically actuated cell, which first of all looks quite similar in the in the waveform. But when we do some calculations and some analysis of the waveform, we, uh, we can see that the force that the live cell is able to generate is much higher than a magnetic cell, which means we can still learn a lot from the efficiency of the live sperm and learn from that to create faster and more efficient uh, artificial swimmers. Now towards biomedical applications, what can we actually do with these sperm templated swimmers? Um, one thing you can do, you can easily load them with cancer drugs. Um, they, because they consist of a biological membrane, it's very easy to load them. And um, because we don't care about the viability of the, sp the sperm, we can load them with actually quite high amounts of drugs and can then uh, magnetically actuate them towards our target. Another nice side effect of adding the magnetic particles is that it really increases the echogenicity of the cells, which means the ability to see these cells or, or detect them in ultrasound. So right now we cannot detect single cells, but swarms of them, which is already um, um, quite promising for being able to track sperm cells uh, in vivo. So in general, my research focus spans from uh, developing microrobotic tools, if, as um, I have shown you so far, to develop robots that have autonomous motion and that allow manipulation of cells like magnetic guidance, biochemical manipulation, and delivery of cells. But I'm also interested more in the biological cells of it. So for example, which factors affect sperm motility and their uh, success rate to get to the egg cell. So in that context, I'm interested in emulating the in vivo conditions to understand more which sperm cells to actually uh, make it to the egg cell. Is it really the fastest ones or is it more the most efficient swimmers or do other physical factors play a role? So um, I'm also investigating the viscoelasticity of the medium and this effect on the sperm motion, the surface charge, um, where we, for example, use nanoparticles to investigate the membrane um, charges of sperm cells, the morphology of the cells, but also the cooperative behavior. And this is something uh, I just started looking into and I will uh, focus more on in the, in the future. And one interesting thing is here that um, we can see that sperm cells tend to pair up. So they, they swim together as two, three or more cells. And these bundles of sperm cells actually swim faster than single sperm under certain conditions. 
And this is also one point where we can potentially learn from it for robotics to, to test if maybe multiple tails are faster than single tails, if we can actuate them right and if we're in the right conditions. So besides these biophysical studies, I'm also um, going to transfer this knowledge to fabricate multi, multiple flagella robots. Um, and then move these towards biomedical applications such as cell or tissue delivery. So with that, I'd like to end and thank you for your attention. And I uh, thank my network very much, global and locally, that support this, uh, this research and make it exciting and successful. And thank you guys for listening and inviting me for this. Thanks. Awesome, very beautiful work. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, where to start from? Can I start probably with something very generic? Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, so can you probably comment on the ethical aspects of this research? How applicable will be that uh, there will be some in, um, in, vitro, in vivo treatments um, with, I don't know, this... Um, uh, with the sperm going and probably, um, I don't know, wh what's the name of that? Just initiate the reproduction. like Yes, um, for, for assisted fertilization. Yeah. So yeah. I think, yes, I think this is a very important point and uh, something we need to address for sure. Um, I think it depends also a bit on the application. For example, if we think about assisted fertilization or in, in general in reproductive technology, it is a very, very sensitive field. So the ethical concerns are very high and um, for sure need to be taken into account. But obviously we also have very strong regulations in many countries, for example, um, to work with human sperm, you need ethics approval. Um, to work with oocytes is even more difficult and, um, and rightly so. Um, so there's some other applications that um, don't have quite as strict ethical concerns. For example, for drug delivery or um, yes, uh, let's say applications that are not targeting fertilization. Um, there, I think we meet the similar ethical concerns that we have with other biohybrid microrobots. And I think this is in general something we, we need to discuss and, um, uh, and target. Mm -hmm. And this is not only mm -hmm. about looking at, for example, at the re immune response and so on, but also other robots that are, for example, bacteria-based um, or nanoparticle-based, we need to ask, also the society, yes, what are the concerns and would they be open for these technologies? Yeah, that's uh, really general then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so for example, when you, when you showed that you actually coated with nanoparticles, the sperm, is the sperm dead? Um, in this case, yes. So in the one, in, in the application I'm uh, presenting here today, Yes, because we do not have, we do not care actually about the motility or the viability. In fact, these, these dead sperm that we coat with particles, we can store for months and they're still intact in a way that mm -hmm. we can use them as robots. But we use a similar technique, let's say electrostatic uh, based interaction in a different study that I didn't present today, where we um, incubate them with live sperm and we investigate the charge map of the sperm cells because in fact, it's not only negatively charged, but we have different charges across the membrane and the particles can be a tool to, to visualize this. Okay, uh, so how do you make it that? Do you just freeze it or is there any other trick? Mm, no, we, um, we wash them in DI water because and? that also removes, uh, removes some, some proteins and some residues and um, the cells do not withstand this for very long. So we wash them in DI water 
then we add the particles and uh, we incubate in the fridge overnight and for mm -hmm. sure the, the cells are dead okay. uh, for sure not motile <laughs> yeah yeah uh so and then you know you showed in the first video how a sperm goes into a, a microtube yes so how do you convince the sperm to go in the microtube like uh what is the uh i don't know what is the uh the, the cue it, it follows the yeah so here what you see here is a sperm cell just randomly entering the tube and you will see this if you have a, a sample with many microtubes and many sperm cells they will enter but there's no directed motion mm -hmm. and this is also one of the tricky things about these because we cannot control the sperm cells and tell them to go from a to b or to enter the sperm cell and there are some approaches we could try so for example we try to to put a um, an extracellular matrix protein inside the, the microtubes fibronectin which sticks the sperm cells but still they have to enter on their own they just mm -hmm. it's more likely that they stay inside uh, you could also try to use chemo attractant but the thing is that um, the um, that the chemotaxis in mammalian sperm is is not trivial it's not like they go from A to B, it's, it's a very complex um, uh, motion. Okay, have you probably tried, I don't know, to make the tube magnetic and then with some uh, Helmut's coils, nested Helmut's coils or other coils to probably direct it in a way and then probably fetch the, 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 the sperm? Like yeah, this is experience. tricky because the sperm cells are super fast. They're really fast. Uh -huh. So we have tried that, but it's not so easy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then you mentioned that you can you can do ultrasound imaging with um, the ones with the coated uh, uh, with the coated sperms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, does that mean if you put them in, you know, theoretically speaking, if you put them in the body, can you can you visualize them in the veins or can you can you can you track them in the body somehow um we have not tried this yet but i think there's some some promise there um of course we are limited by the resolution so in ultrasound you always have this trade-off between resolution and depth okay so yeah. if we don't need to image very deep like you say in a vein but it's maybe relatively close to to the outside to the to the probe um it's very likely that can, we can get get high resolution of of 50 micrometers but if we want to go very deep uh inside the body then we used we lose the resolution but yeah. i think it's promising especially for swarms or for larger groups of cells that have uh, a large enough amount of magnetic particles that we can make them visible. Uh, that's interesting. So, but actually, you can you can probably use it in the superficial veins close to the uh, to the dermis to the to the. To the yes, skin. yes, I think so. Yes. Uh, so another question: You also mentioned that your uh, are you now investigating collaborative behavior? Uh, what's going to happen if you really have I don't know dense amount of sperms like like. I don't know if you are aware with this active matter research where they just see different phases occurring when you just change the concentration. Yes, this is really interesting. Uh, and I think this had, has not been investigated too much on sperm cells. So I know that if, the, if you have a high density of sperm cells, you get some interesting swarming behavior as well. Mm -hmm. Like kind of vortex, uh, vortex um, yeah. appear. Uh, I have not looked at that yet. Uh, my plan is to look more at the, uh, say, a little bit lower level of complexity of having one versus two, three, four, five, ten cells, mm -hmm. and then really um, bundled up and see how the flagella synchronize with each other or how they manage to bundle and then swim faster than single sperm. This is my main goal for the next years. In mm -hmm. fact, I yeah, I just uh, received funding to investigate more this behavior in the next three years. 
So I'd be happy to get input, for example, from active matter people that are also interested awesome. in these mm -hmm. phenomena. That would be really interesting to talk about. Great. Okay, these are some now conversations that should probably go off record about potential collaboration. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Okay, awesome. Well, that's all. I don't have any other questions. And uh, again, very beautiful uh, work. And I hope that uh, the viewers who watch this will get greatly inspired and probably copy or steal some of your ideas. Why not? You know, research <laughs> <Why open>. not? <laughs> Yes, and feel free to contact me uh, if you need anything or if you're interested in talking, I, I'm happy to share. Yeah. And thanks so much for inviting me, for having me, Zoan. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Veronica. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.